What's up, everybody? Welcome to a new week of Q and A. This week, I'm be I'm uh, joined by Matthew, the bass player. Welcome to uh, welcome to the Q and A. What's up, y'all? All right. So, how's things going, dude? Things are going well, man. I mean, as uh, kind of as well as can be expected in this uh, in this current climate. I mean, um, mm -hmm. I was <laughs> I was supposed to be on tour for another five or six months again this year, like I was last year, and obviously all of that got shot to total hell in, <laughs> in late March or it's I, I think that's when it was. That March feels like five years ago, so it's it's hard to remember, but. Uh, I, I definitely know the feeling it's uh, that, that's actually kind of one thing that I wanted to like really talk about and bring up with this particular Q&A is that the social aspect like you are a, a working musician you do this full time and making that transition from touring life to studio life and social media and everything like you seem like you're a very very active person on social media and I kind of want to break down some of those aspects for people who are considering doing something similar to, uh, to what you're doing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So first, like, how, how did you get into like the session work originally? Um, I mean, I've been I've been doing session work for basically as long as I've been doing uh, live performance work. Uh, I I came up in the, the the LA music scene playing clubs and everything, and I've been doing that for when did I start doing that professionally? Two thousand and eight, I think, something like that. So kind of a long time. Um, and yeah, I mean, sort of like any other freelance kind of business, it's especially at the beginning, it's all about, you know, building that network. So you, you play a lot of gigs that you aren't necessarily super stoked about just to get on stage in front of new people. Cause it might not even be about the gig that you're playing. It's about whoever's there, you know, to see the gig happening to see you and they need that kind of person for a job themselves. So that's I, I think that's one of the more important aspects about the 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 social networking part of the job is that you know even even if the gig that you have at the moment isn't the gig that you necessarily want you really never know who the people who you're meeting there might be able to affect your career in the future. Um, but one of the, one of the bigger gigs that I've had I, I was I was playing with uh, LP when she was back back when she was signed with Warner Brothers, and that was uh, 16, I think. Um, and the only reason I got that gig is I met the guitar player who was on that job, and another super small time gig that never really did anything. We played a couple shows, and that was sort of it. Um, but he ended up getting uh, getting the gig playing with 98 Degrees, and then that MD referred him to the MD for this thing, and then the, the bass player who was originally referred in just kind of totally shit the bed during the first day of rehearsals and he got fired and the MD was like, Hey band, we go on tour next week. Do you know anyone who can do this? And that's how I got hired. Super short notice, all of a sudden playing gigantic shows with, if you guys aren't familiar with LP, uh, you need to check her out. She's like literally one of the most talented singers around right now. Um, so yeah, I kind of, kind of always go after it full force because you just really never know what the thing that you're doing right now is going to turn into in the future. Right, right. You see a lot of the, uh, you, you, see, you see so many of those like stories of people who are like, yeah, we played to a show with there's only like five people, but one of them was the, the exec or whatever, you know, like, and just because they decided to rock out as hard every single show they ended up actually getting the gig because they just put it all out there every single time. Yeah. hundred percent, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be the same show regardless of whether there's five people or 5,000 people there. It's, you know, they, they all paid, they all deserve a show. That's, that's, that's what you're there for. Uh, I was, I was watching a bit of the Garth Brooks documentary and he was basically talking about the same thing. Like, have you seen it? I haven't. No. Dude, it's super, it's crazy. The only reason he got his record deal initially, he played an open mic night where uh, he ended up taking the slot of another guy who didn't show up and a label that had already passed on signing him was there to see the other guy play. <laughs> so after he took this other guy's slot and just blew him away, they, they went over to his manager and like, hey, so I think we missed something with this guy last week. Bring him back in. And that's how we got signed. That's incredible. Yeah. Literally that week, the label's like, nah, you're not what I want. And then just 
by basically by accident or coincidence or divine intervention, whatever you happen to believe in. He, sure, sure. Yeah, he well, was he, was presented a, he was presented a, a situation that would be beneficial. He put himself out there and it ended up, you know, paying off immensely. Yeah. Yep. That's, it's pretty interesting because like you, you like, I'm, I'm curious to get your take on, on this sort of idea that like some people could take away what you just said as take every opportunity and grind it until you potentially make it, you know, take, you know, like put yourself out there 110% all the time. Like, but is there a balance between doing that and being discerning between any specific job, like, like types or like, is there something that you would initially say no to? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think, I think in a lot of ways, it depends on where you're at in your career. Um, and I, I honestly, I had to learn this lesson the hard way just a couple of years ago. Like I said, I've, I've been, I've been doing this for uh, a long time. Uh, so this was in 2018. So at this point I'd been playing music and recording music professionally for 10 years. And just because of the way the industry works, like enough of my gigs had just stopped happening. Um, and because for a long time, a lot of the gigs, especially locally that I was getting, it was a matter of me basically constantly performing uh, in in a live setting somewhere, and then someone else would see me and want to hire me to work with them, and that that is basically kind of what perpetuated that cycle forward. And then, in like I guess seventeen, um, when enough of those bands stopped working, my social circle just like kind of slowly, but in a in a way rapidly, got smaller. So I was, I was getting less new gigs because I was playing less gigs and less people were seeing me. And, uh, and then at a certain point in 18, basically I wasn't, I wasn't really getting any calls for new stuff anymore. Um, I, I had some, had some really cool tour stuff with a, a band Zoviet. We were in Mexico a bit, but aside from that, my career was pretty much like dry and kind of dead. Like at the end of, at the end of 18, I was like, well, I guess I have to start doing something else for work. And, and in a way that was my own fault because I'd kind of forgotten that, you know, if you, if you aren't getting the work that you want to get, um, because you're, you know, you're, you're sure that your, your time is worth a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. And in, in one way it may be because you might actually have the skills and expertise that you should be able to command a certain rate. But if people aren't calling you for work, your, your time's fucking worthless. So you need, you need, <laughs> you need to go you know, need to go eat shit and grind it out again. So once I kind of, I, I both kind of simultaneously just made peace with, I guess I can do something else for work. I'll try, you know, voice acting or personal training or something. And at the same time, just started hanging out with some more of my musician buddies and ended up getting referred the audition for the Diamante gig. And that's what I've been doing uh, for the last year. And then kind of all at the same time, more new people started calling me, partly because I was out in the public eye more playing more shows. Um, so, so some of the, the older um, session clients that I'd had for a while just started getting busier. So, I mean, this business in particular is really kind of, you know, feast or famine in a lot of ways. And um, be, being able to ride out those, those slow, slow isn't even the right word. Just, yeah, just droughts of work. Usually they're shorter, but in that case for me, it was, it was long and part of it was my own fault because I was, I was saying no to stuff that I probably should have said yes to because I didn't have the work coming in. So I needed to get back out there and remind people that I existed. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta be visible for people to know that you're there. You gotta put yourself yeah. out there. Um, so you said that you were on tour with Diamante, like, this around this time last year, you were on tour with bands like Breaking Benjamin, Chevelle, Three Days Grace. Like, what's it like to go from that to what you're doing now? <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, the 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 swing of the last two years of my work life and its totality has been pretty dramatic. To go from basically making peace with my musical career being over to playing. <laughs> I mean, that, that was probably the biggest tour that I've, I'm, it was definitely the biggest tour that I've ever done. And also some of the biggest shows that I've ever played. Um, you know, we, we did 80 shows on that summer run. It, it, we were out like almost three solid months. It was, it was the whole summer. Um, 
And again, we were supposed to be doing that, that kind of stuff again this year. We had a bunch of really big festival shows booked and had tours on the books. And, uh, you know, in, I've, I've talked about this with some other musician friends. In, in one way, I feel like it's actually been easier for musicians, especially touring musicians, to mentally adapt to this new switch. Um, just because once these initial lockdowns started happening, we all kind of knew that we were all fucked until way later. You know what I mean? We weren't, we weren't, you know, just waiting until next week when we could go back to work and things were going to be normal. Everything was just totally blown to shit. And we had to totally figure out something entirely new to do until maybe next year sometime. Yeah. So in that way, I think for us, it was a blessing because we weren't stuck in this mental purgatory, just, you know, waiting for us to be able to go back to work at the bar or go back to the movies or whatever um, the, the traditional lifestyle thing is that people were um, used to getting back to. Right. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I, since, since I've been doing session work for a while and also remote session work from, from my home studio, uh, it wasn't all that difficult to transition over uh, per se, just because I was just doing more of something that I was already doing instead of totally starting from scratch. Um, it was just more about, uh, con continuing to branch out in, into that direction and, and bring in more new clients. Cause obviously I, I have the time now it's, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not making records on the, on the bus <laughs> like I, right. like I was last year. Um, so well, yeah, you've also and, and, been incredibly prolific on the social media stage. Like I've, I've seen your, your posts in the threads and like posting music, posting bass content, like, and on for many different channels as well, not just for your own. Um, so actually a question kind of follows into this is, uh, from Prashuria. He asks, uh, dude, how do you get followers and attract the right audience and then retain those followers? Man, uh, that, that, that's a great question. And uh, I, I can just tell you what I do. Uh, the, the reason, the main reason that I make content is because that's what makes my soul happy. You know, uh, if, if, I can't, if I can't actually be out there performing live music, I need to be, I need to be creative and like actually create something tangible every day in order to really be satisfied in my life just in general. Um, so I, I like sharing it with people, but even if social media didn't exist, honestly, I'd still be making these kinds of, uh, like bass playthrough things just so I could listen to them and be like, ah, look at that cool thing I made. It just, it's just enjoyable for me. Um, so the stuff that I post on social media is really just stuff that I make that I think is cool. And sometimes other people think it's cool too. And I'm, I'm always happy to, you know, talk, talk gear and technique advice and whatever else people want to talk about that's related to the stuff that I'm posting. Um, cause I, I definitely remember what it was be like, you know, 10 years ago when I was first starting out and, um, I mean, social media wasn't nearly as, <laughs> as big of a thing then, man. I mean, I don't even, I don't even remember it when Instagram started, but it was maybe right around then or not quite yet. I mean, I'm not even sure it was a thing. Was something it? something like that i mean like it yeah. definitely is a lot bigger now within the last yeah. like, two years it feels like it's been like because facebook started in what 2006 is, is that has it only been since then i think it's, i think so it's, 2004 so maybe since, yeah, like I, it, it really hasn't been that long right right so um yeah so i mean in a lot of ways everyone's just kind of learning as they go but i i, I think i think the the way to be successful is just to make stuff that you're passionate about and right. share it with people. And uh, eventually people are going to find it and be passionate about it too. Cause that's, you know, we're, we're all connected through the internet and regardless of how niche the thing is that you're into, there's people who are also into it regardless of what it is. If, it, if furries <laughs> can find each other, if people who like bass stuff can find each other. You know what I mean? There, there you have it, everybody. Uh, from Matthew, the bass player. If you're a furry, people will find you. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's no, a shoe I, for every foot. I, th I think that that's really, I think that's really powerful because I feel that that's like, find something that you are interested in and make something of it. 
people will find you, your audience will find you. Consistency also helps, like posting on a regular basis always helps because people know what to expect from you so they can continue following you. And I think that, yeah. yeah, I think that there's a level, there always has to be a level of authenticity to the content that you're making, because if you're not authentic, people can see through that. Easily Absolutely. see through that. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's being in the realm of like social content and, and, you know, posting all the time and doing a lot of research. Like I have to watch a lot of other people's content to get like ideas and to, you know, try and try and maybe take things from their like aspects of what they're doing to improve what I'm doing. And there's some people out there, you know, obviously I I'm not going to name names or anything, but like there's people who are on YouTube that it's like, you're not, you shouldn't be on YouTube. Like you shouldn't be making content. You should be the person behind the camera. You should be the person producing this stuff. You should be making the music for other people because what you're doing, you're trying to be somebody else. And it's big. It's very, very inauthentic. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, the other aspect of that too, is if you're not, if you aren't authentic about the thing that you're doing and you're not passionate about the thing that you're doing, you're just, you're, there's no way that you're going to want to put in the amount of time and effort that is required to succeed at the thing mm -hmm. kind of regardless of what you're talking about. It doesn't matter what field, whether it's music or fucking bodybuilding or being a doctor, if you're not going to, if you're not going to put in the 10,000 hours to master the craft, it's just right. not, it's not going to happen. And there's no way that you can do that. If you're not just on fire about learning and growing every day, it's, you know, I mean, the, the only way, reason I can kind of play bass okay now is I went to I went to a music school and you're basically sort of forced to play your instrument for eight to ten hours a day and now I've got tendonitis and can play pretty all right so <laughs> you know I know that feeling I definitely yeah. know that feeling yeah no I, I I saw the bleed video I you're, oh, you're still not oh my god do you like I le legit after after like recording the uh uh, recording the session like I, I just like I just went through it just did like but 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 like right hand all the way like I ended up having to like ice my wrist down and my forearm down for like less like, next to like hour or two afterwards I'm like uh, yeah I can, I'll, I'll, I can only imagine I, I won't do that again it's okay <laughs> <laughs> there's like there's certain things like now I'm at a position where I'm like can I just hire somebody else to do this I think I can I yeah <laughs> But um, as far as uh, networking is concerned, because you're you're not only just co creating content for yourself too, you're also creating a lot of content with other people. Like, yep. can you speak to how you decide to choose who is in your network and what projects you want to take on, which ones you don't? Sure. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of that just has to do with uh, the gear that I already use or like I'm interested in, in checking out. I've seen or heard lots of good things about it. So I'm curious to try it for myself and I'll reach out to those people. I mean, in, in some ways it's similar to uh, the way that it's always been like any of the, the long-term um, business relationships that I have with brands endorsements and that kind of thing was always for, at least for me, a matter of going to NAM and trying out their stuff and if I was into it, talking with the people about it and letting them know who I was and what I was doing and that I was interested in using their stuff and helping them promote it. And that's mm -hmm. kind of it. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, the, the, the brands that I'm still working with and helping to promote are, are the same. Um, so some of them I've been working with for a number of years. Like I've been a, a Dingwall artist for, I don't know, probably five years now, something like that. Mm -hmm. Long enough that I remember when uh, Sheldon didn't even have his own booth at the NAMM show. He just, <laughs> he just got a couple of bases at the hip shot booth. And now that dude is so busy that he's turning away new dealers, which has been awesome to see. Uh, he totally deserves it. Just Agreed. Yeah. Great, Agreed. great dude, great gear. But I mean, as far as as far as brands go that's what they want to see they they want they want to work with people who are excited about the tools that they make for creative people that's that's really what it boils down to um and then as far as the the people that i'm collaborating with it's for for the most part it's been musicians that i've played with in some capacity uh especially in the last year or two whether it was you know physically on tour 
sharing a stage together or um, what, one of the other bands that was on the tour, um, uh, especially the ones that aren't on the, you know, the, 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 the peak peak level where they can in, in, in some ways just kind of ride this out and wait for the next thing. Uh, a lot of us are still in the middle of having, having to grind and figure it out. Um, so staying connected and involved with those people and just putting together new stuff where we can keep showing the world, Hey, we exist and this is what we do. And hopefully you like it too. has been a, has been a useful and satisfying thing to do. Yeah. Agreed. I think that, uh, and, and it's a really simple thing too, when upkeep of your network is, is very important. Even just commenting on everybody's posts when you see them, just a simple emoji, even just to keep your, you know, keep that level of attention and, and visibility. I think it's just, it's just a simple thing that people don't really tend to think about as much as they should. Yeah. And, it, and it's the right thing to do too, man. I mean, um, but, but, and one way to look at it is, is everyone who's doing this kind of thing is basically a small business owner, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're, if your friend owns a small business, you want to see your friend succeed, right? So you'd go patronize their small business. Like if your friend is a barber, you wouldn't go to the chain Floyd's barber shop. No, you'd go see your friend and have him cut your hair and then write a Yelp review about how good your friend is. So yeah, if, if, if you if you and your homies are musicians doing creative musical things and putting them online, support the shit out of each other. Right. And everyone succeeds that way. It's not there's it's not like a competition to see who wins. Everyone can win at the same time. <laughs> Agreed. No, I, I, I think that I, I've never been one in that gets into competition quite as much because I think that mutual success you know, helps everybody. It's not, it's not a, I succeed and you lose sort of thing. I really do think that a rising tide raises all boats. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, those people who do view it as competition, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I've never had that mindset, so I don't really empathize it with it very much, you know? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can understand it to a degree. I mean, again, to reference back when I was at school, that that kind of competitiveness of being the best player in the room was super useful in, mm -hmm. in that situation. But that didn't mean that I wanted to be in a room with a bunch of loser players. Right. And ideally, that means you're you're in a room with a bunch of fucking sharks. You're just the biggest and the baddest shark in the room. <laughs> so you don't like, you know, all, all the all of your all of your friends and the people that you interface with, you want them to be the, the biggest and baddest dudes on the street. You just want to be at that cutting edge too. So you're not you're not trying to push them down. You're trying to bring them up because that forces you to raise your level too. Agreed, man. Agreed. I mean, I I can't tell you how dumb I feel whenever I'm in a call with any of the neural DSP guys. Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I can only imagine. I, it, I I'm a bass player. I only play one note at a time. I, I there's <laughs> there's no way I know how any of that shit works. Oh, agreed. I you know I think that. What, 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 I'm sure it's probably been popularized by Gary Vee, but I, I don't know if he coined the phrase or if he came up with it, but like you're the average of the five people that you hold closest to you. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And you should make sure that those five people are smarter and better than you. And at least one thing for sure. Like, man. Otherwise you're, you're losing and it, it's just yeah. not, it's just not good. Yep. Yeah. Right. Rising tides. It's, yeah. That's what it's all about. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, the, the, the neural DSP guys are just like, they're, they're, they're super smart, they're super smart. And I like, I consider myself like a pretty, pretty well-rounded individual. Like, I feel like I'm pretty like versatile, like I figure things out, but then I hang out with them and I'm like, <laughs> totally. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, okay. same, I, you know, I, I make the self-deprecating bass player jokes, but I think I'm a fairly smart dude until yeah. I'm in a room with some really smart dudes. Yes. You know what yeah. I mean? Joe Rogan made a funny joke about that some years ago. He was talking about how, you know, generally I'm pretty much the smartest guy in any room that I'm in. That's not actually a good thing. I don't know how this fucking microphone works. So <laughs> that can't be good. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned that you did go to, uh, to school that, 
how how do you feel that that's uh, affected your play style? Has it made you appreciate many different styles and like kind of rounded yeah. out your playing and abilities? A hundred percent, yes. Um, so I, I originally, when I originally went to college, I was going to study recording engineering because um, that's that's kind of what got me involved. I I, I didn't actually play music at all in high school, uh, not 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 at all. Um, some friends of mine put together a really terrible punk rock cover band covering like Blitzkrieg Bop and really old bad religion songs like Fuck Armageddon, This Is Hell, like late 80s or early 80s, way, way long ago. Uh, and fortunately, they were all so terrible at playing that they couldn't possibly play those songs and yell into a microphone at the same time. So they just got me to sing for the band. And in the process of doing that, uh, I ended up starting to record us on uh, most people watching are probably too young to even remember this era, but a uh, musician's friend used to sell these uh, red um, four track digital recording boxes by a company called Fostex that I don't even know if they exist anymore. They used to use the giant SD cards that were like this big, not the little ones. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, you know, I was, I was recording demos for our band and then the rest of our friends band, in, in high school with it, with that little thing. And sometimes it actually came out pretty, pretty great. And other times they just sounded like shit. And eventually I, I was like, well, this is super cool. And I need to figure out how to do this better. And mm -hmm. again, this is way before the era where YouTube was the resource that it is now where you can, I mean, YouTube is the new university. It yes. really is. You can, you can learn how to do anything from some of the most talented people the world has ever seen literally just by going onto your computer. But back in 2004, that was not a thing. Right. So I, I, I didn't even know that Pro Tools existed at, at this point in time. Again, I'm, I'm using this, this dumb little, it was literally about this big. It's a terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible <laughs> machine. So, so I, I went to school to learn more about that. And uh, I, I guess somewhat fortuitously, the school that I went to did not have a great music program, but they mm. had a really great party school. So I mostly spent my time having a lot of fun and uh, picked up a bass and started teaching myself how to play just by listening to some of my favorite punk rock records and figuring stuff out by ear. And I ended up uh, the second year there living in a house off campus where one of the other guys was uh, not a student. He was just uh, working down from uh, Northern California, working to save up money to, to go to MI in Hollywood. And again, I'd never heard of that place before. And all of a sudden I was like, huh, maybe, maybe I should do that. So that's what brought me there. Um, and I mean, up until that point, I was I was totally just like a punk rock guy and then kind of got into the more, you know, really advanced styles of playing bass, like, you know, Victor Wooten, Stu Ham, and all of the crazy slapping and two-handed tapping uh, stuff, which is still really cool, no doubt. Sure, um, sure. But as a gigging musician, no one gives a shit about any of that. That's that's literally never going to get you a job. In some cases, doing that stuff on a gig is actually going to get you fired from a job. If I had if I'd showed up to the the LP audition with a six string uh, Yamaha bass and played all of my coolest slap licks, I would have been sent home a hundred percent for sure. Know so, your audience. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So so being being at school and and being around teachers who'd been in the game for a long time and could do all that stuff, but also knew the importance of being versatile within styles um, and knowing the importance of playing songs and playing the right parts for the songs with the right sound for those parts. That was that was definitely a really important aspect of being able to kind of immediately transition out of that setting into being a full-time working musician as I, as I have been for the last 12 years. Um, right. cause it really is about both things. Uh, no, knowing, knowing the styles and, you know, having the musicality to play the parts that are, that are right for those songs. That's why guys like Pino Palladino keep getting calls to go on tour for $10,000 a week. That's what he gets paid. Uh, cause he just plays the right stuff all the time. No one has to tell him anything. It just sounds perfect from the first note that he plays. Mm -hmm. um, and the other aspect of that is he uses the right tools for the job. So whether that means, you know, a, a P bass with uh, flat wound strings for the John Mayer stuff or using a, using a fretless uh, stingray with round wounds for some of the pop stuff that he's done over the years makes a big difference. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I, I like the idea of playing to your audience, though, too. That, that's such such an interesting thing that you can play all these different things. Like, because I, 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 I see it a lot, especially with a lot of the competitions. I'll, I'll talk about the competitions for a second. So we get yeah. we have these neural DSP competitions, and then we see, you know, we have these, like, I supply tracks normally and then let people just do whatever they want over it. And it's it's fascinating seeing people who play to the music and then play over the music if you know what i mean like a hundred percent yes <laughs> it's 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 fantastic watching this because some people just don't have the right mindset because it's more ego driven than it is anything else for sure man yeah if it's 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 got to be it, it doesn't have to be but the best way to do it is to put the music first mm -hmm. so i mean I guess in some ways I have an advantage in that way because the bass player isn't the spotlight position in a band. It's a, it's a lot more of a foundational role in understanding how to connect those, uh, those other elements in the mm -hmm. band. It's, it's essentially the bridge between the, the, the harmony and the melody and the, the rhythm. Yes. So, you know, uh, that, that joke about only playing one note at a time is totally true. But at the same time, if I play the wrong note or the wrong length of note or put that one note in the wrong spot, the whole thing just goes to shit. Yep. Um, yep. yep. But since, since I come from that, that mindset, being, being able to, to serve the song is, is generally easier than someone who's more uh, inclined by the position in their band to look for those moments that say, hey, look at me. Because mm -hmm. in some ways, that's what, you know, a lead guitar player needs to be able to play all, side, all kinds of cool, hey, look at me stuff, especially if they have solos in the band and that kind of that kind of thing. It can't be it can't can't be all uh, uh, background foundational work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, I think it was uh, I was watching a video of uh, Devin Townsend. Right. And he was he was playing some bass. He's like, yeah, no, I absolutely I actually love playing the bass because you're like the rudder of the ship guitar player could be doing whatever he's doing, you know, and he's could be just like ripping on something. And it's like, Hey, as long as I'm on this one note, that's where you're staying. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's totally true. That's one of the super fun things about bass. Like, uh, you can, you can literally change the chord that's being played by changing what the bass note is. You know, the, the, the guitarist might want to play, uh, Well, let's 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 use a, an, an easy comparison. They, they they might be trying to play uh, a D minor, but if you're if you're playing F, that chord's fucking F major. Yes, <laughs> that's just yes. what it is. <laughs> <laughs> they can't stop you. There's nothing they can do about it. They're playing the same thing, but you've you've totally changed the underlying harmony structure by the choice that you made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh man, so this is uh, okay. So this is actually a good uh, a good question. So this is kind of retreading a little bit of uh, uh, prior prior question that we talked about uh because he's asking uh, epic chicken is asking how would you go about getting an audience but he framed it a little bit differently by saying i definitely hate the whole cold call thing where you just plug your music to random people prefer to keep it organic but then you stay small i would actually say you don't have to stay small by keeping it organic i think that if you me personally and i'll, I'll put my input and in, would definitely love to hear yours as well but i think that if you keep it interactive, interesting, entertaining, ask questions and really engage with the people that you want to be following you. I feel like that is the best way to get good organic growth, but I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well. No, man. I mean, that, that is a hundred percent it. And I think, I think that one of the bigger stumbling blocks for people is they just want it to happen faster than it's, than it's going to happen. Um, and again, kind of regardless of what you're talking about, whether it's, you know, your favorite professional athlete or your, your favorite band that, you know, just, just got their big break overnight, that shit did not happen overnight. You did, you did not see them grind for 10 plus years doing all of the shitty playing to fucking nobody aside from the bartender gigs that they did sleeping in vans, sleeping on floors eating fucking gas station food you saw it you saw you saw none of that so you just think all of a sudden oh yeah they just got that's and it's the it's the same thing with social media you, you mentioned gary b earlier uh if you guys don't follow him follow gary v mm -hmm. that dude just knows what's going on 
uh, and he preaches the same thing all the time. He's, you know, he's huge now, but 10 years ago, nobody knew who he was. He was, yep. he was just a dude working for his dad's wine company. Yep. He wasn't anybody. And now everyone thinks he's this guru because he learned and just ground it out for a decade and earned that position. So, um, yeah, if you're, you know, kind of circling back to what we were talking about earlier, if you're making content that you're really passionate about and you enjoy making and you enjoy the process of interfacing with new people and and teaching them about it and helping them learn and that's that's how you're making your mark in the world eventually it's going to happen it's just about being patient enough and consistent enough to put in the time over time right to to make it happen i mean the the, the old adage about you know every band is a successful band as long as they don't break up because <laughs> that's that's the key Ev eventually the band's going to get their break they just have to do it for long enough. And most people aren't willing or usually able because it's freaking hard to do, yep. to, you know, put in, put in 10 years of work, but yeah, gr growing a big social media channel, even if you're going, the, going the cheater baby way and, you know, pay paying for uh, all kinds of, you know, sponsored ads and engagement and stuff, it's still going to take a while to grow. And then it's going to cost you thousands of dollars to do it that way. Right. So it's, it's it's either or either either you, you throw in a, a ton of financial investment up front and grow it faster for sure it will grow faster that's you know that's what a major label does with a new artist they right. spend literally millions of dollars promoting this new thing so that people know about it or you do it the old-fashioned way with with word of mouth and consistent work output those right. are kind of the two choices well, I think that even to to drill down on the subject even further, I feel like the one of the best practices that you can have when you're looking at trying to grow your own content is looking at other people's content and not necessarily taking what they do, but like finding the framework that they're working out of. Like, are they asking questions? Are they giving opinions? Like, what what are they doing that's garnering attention and interaction? You know, is it the is it just the content itself, or is it prompts? Where are they sharing it? Who are they sharing it to? Are they tagging people in it? Uh, who are they working with? Like, I asking these sorts of questions will give you a much better understanding on how you can work through your own content to get that growth out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Le learning from the people who are already doing the thing that you want to do is the best thing that you could possibly do. I mean, that that's why I basically stopped attending my original college classes, because I realized kind of quickly that if this is what I wanted to do for a living, I, c I can't be learning from people who are teaching at a state school because they're not doing what I want to do for a living. They're yes. teaching at a state school, which is fine. For them, that's what they've decided. And that's that's a perfectly valid expression of their their choices and creativity and contribution but if that's not what you want to do you should probably be learning from the people who are doing the stuff that you want to do absolutely i, I think that was actually uh so like what really kind of like started me on this whole like journey over the last three three four years now that of of audio and work with neural and everything was like one decision it was to go to the urm summit so like the unstoppable recording machine is a an audio education company and they held this like meeting up in florida and i was like i just lost my job i have enough money to get me to florida so that way i can spend the whole weekend with a ton of people who have already done exactly what i want to do and it was invaluable to be able to put myself in that position and you don't necessarily have to you know, spend thousands of dollars to go to a, a conference, especially right now, because you can't, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, putting yourself in the position where you can learn from those people is always going to benefit your outlook in the long run. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, on social media now, you, I mean, you kind of have direct access to all of those people. So yeah. if you want to ask those people a question, Ask him, man. Even honestly, even if it's a like a big name uh, mix engineer, if you love the mix on one of their records and have a question about how they did it, figure out how to get in touch with them and reach out. A lot yes. of times they're going to write back to you because they're still passionate about what they're doing, and they're not 
these people aren't worried that you're going to like come take their job or some nonsense like that. Cause <laughs> again, they've put in the time to establish themselves as a known commodity that people are going to want to hire to do this job and pay them uh, a rate that is commensurate with that level of uh, track record and experience and expertise. So they're, they're happy to tell you anything that you want to know for the most part about how they did whatever they did on your favorite record. So whether it was, reaching out to those people or reaching out to your favorite bass players. I mean, there's that one guy from Royal blood who's never going to tell you what's in his signal chain. Cause that's, <laughs> that's his secret sauce. But aside from that, most everybody else is happy, happy to share. So uh, at, at some point you and I are going to have to roll down that, that rabbit hole um, for some, for some neural content that, that, that'll be fun. I think. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, oh, yeah. I had, I had, I had, had a thought. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, so you just mentioned, and I, and I think that this is an interesting subject to to talk to somebody who who has a social presence. Is that how would you advise somebody who's just starting, who's basically and and no uh, negative implications by this, but is somebody who's basically a nobody who wants to reach out to somebody? Uh, what do you think the best practices are? What do you think are some of the, the, the mistakes that some people make as well in reaching out to people who you maybe admire or want to learn from? I mean, I think the only mistake that you can make is to be, uh, be like demanding or entitled. And I feel like, I, at least me personally, I haven't experienced that too often. But I mean, I, I've, I've heard from guys, I was talking to uh, Nathan Navarro about this the other day. He gets some fucking crazy dms about stuff like <laughs> some, some dude messaged him like hey give me that base that you use in the video the fuck is wrong with you man don't do that that's not gonna work that's terrible. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> but, but but aside from that yeah i mean if you have because i mean in in a lot of ways even me personally i'm still a nobody in the music world like i'm definitely not a known uh, commodity outside of my particular social circle mm -hmm. um so, um, but yeah, for even for someone who's, you know, literally just starting and they have no followers on their channel and they, they want to learn how to, you know, get this bass sound or how did you do this lighting thing or whatever, just reach out and ask. Mm -hmm. there's, I, don't, I don't think there's really a bad way to go about it as long as you're excited about learning and complimentary of what the, the person that you're reaching out to is doing. And that's just going to come naturally because you do like the thing that they're doing. Yes. And that's why you are reaching out to them. It's sort, of, sort of the same thing with, with getting involved with, with companies and, and representing their gear and having you, uh, you know, kind of like mutually lift each other up. It's, it's the same thing. If you, want, if you want to get an endorsement, don't reach out to Neural DSP and say, hey, give me free stuff. That just makes you look like an asshole. I've, got, I've no gotten one, a lot of those. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's never going to work. That, that just makes you look like a dick face. Don't do that. Uh, if you're if you're interested in working with a new company, reach out to them. Genuinely excited about the product that they're putting out and what it is that they're doing, and just let them know who you are and why you're excited about it and how you'd like to grow with them moving forward. Yeah, I've had a ton of really great conversations from just people reaching out, just you know, hitting up like my Facebook or my Instagram, and just saying, "Hey, I love the stuff." You know, uh, I had a question about this and normally if I have the time, I have no problem getting back to, to, you know, messages, you know, I've had some weird people like send me just like the, 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 like the, the wave emoji. And that I feel is like, is a big no, no. It's just like, that's ah, just, no, don't say, Hey, how's it going? Or hi, uh, you yeah, know, I love that video you just put up. Yeah, if, if the poke option on Facebook is still a thing, don't fucking poke people. That's always been super weird. I don't know why that was ever a thing, but no no positive, useful engagement has ever come out of a stranger digitally poking someone else. Zuckerberg, if you're listening, turn that shit off if that's still on. That's stupid. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, changing gears just a little bit. Um are you doing any sort of like producing, mixing or engineering right now? Yeah, um, you know, not, not as much as I'd, I'd like to be doing, um, you know, to, to again, circle back. It's kind of funny how it's sort of come full circle for me in that 
I was initially going to get into that aspect of music specifically before I ever started playing bass. And um, in in some ways, my my obsession with just becoming a, a better bass player and spending all of my time doing that at music school in a way was um, wasn't beneficial um, just because it was too hyper specialized. And that was right around the era of, you know, when guys like uh, Misha from Periphery were first starting to blow up on like seven string posting, posting as bulb. And now he's, you know, he's a, he's a big known commodity now again. Yes. Now the perfect example, that guy did not have success overnight. He was a fucking nobody posting on a guitar nerd forum, all of yep. his nerdy, cool guitar stuff that he was doing for years before he ever even put a band together. Mm-hmm. And that still wasn't anything for a while. No one cared about Periphery for years. And now he's got, you know, signature pedals and he's doing Get Good Drums and it's sort of a big deal. But again, that's 10 years worth of work. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so so in, in, in that way, uh, I definitely wish back when I was at music school, I spent a lot more time also learning about the the production aspect of things. Because back then, the only thing I really learned how to do was how to program drums, uh, which I'm now also very, very proficient at. But other stuff, like even just learning other DAWs really well. Like I'm still super slow on Pro Tools because I started on Cubase and... Pro Tools is just in some ways so needlessly confusing. Like, yo, why did you guys even lay it out that way? Uh, and, and that's actually doing the drum programming thing is what pushed me in the direction of Cubase to begin with. Because I've heard it's better now, but for a long time, programming MIDI stuff in Pro Tools was just a uh, hellscape. It's it was awful. Pain. It's, it's okay. I, 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 I definitely, <laughs> I actually came from Cubase originally. I had like, dude, I had, I had the, I had the, the bedroom producer cracked cubase 5 and waves cracked mercury bundle right. <laughs> you know and, and and uh so i started with cubase and i i instantly fell in love with it but i you know when it came down to it i had the opportunity to work with an engineer in la he was like well what daw do you use i'm like i, I work in cubase he's like oh well i work in pro tools and i'm like okay i work in pro tools now yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's born I mean, out and that's, a, that's another really good example of a of a good uh, work practice, like throwing yourself into the fire, like you did. Yep. What base if you're if you're trying to do something for a job and you don't know how to do it yet, and someone asks you if you can, fucking say yes and then figure it out. Don't say no or sort of or no. Yeah, say say yes. I can abs- I can totally do that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you're a session guitarist and someone calls you to do a. Uh, an album's worth of mandolin say yes and figure out how to play mandolin and make that money and then be the guy who everyone calls for mandolin yeah 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 well i mean like that was like uh when the cory wong came out i'm like i've never played funk before but i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna learn it i'm gonna do my best at it you know i i feel like that is that is indicative of success so much more so than anything else is your ability to just figure it out Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but as, as far as the, the production thing goes, what really kind of pushed me back into doing that was a band of mine did uh, uh, a record a couple of years ago, and we hired a, a really big name guy to, to mix it because none of us knew anything about that at that point. And I won't I won't name names because you, you guys definitely know who this is. Uh, <laughs> he, he did a really bad job. Uh, mm. he, he just he just didn't care. And you could tell in the work that, you know, it wasn't the worst sounding thing in the world, but it should have sounded 10 times better based on what we'd given him uh, if he actually put the time in. You know, the first mix he sent back maybe two hours after getting, you know, 100 tracks worth of audio, which means he just, you know, threw it into a template and maybe made a couple little corrections and didn't do any automation and sent it back. Um, But in a way, I'm super grateful that he did that because that that pushed me back into, well, I've got to figure out how to do this stuff myself now because I don't I don't ever want to go through the process of spending this amount of time and energy and creative passion putting pouring into this this thing and then just leave it in the hands of someone who even if they do care, they might not totally understand what my creative vision is. And if I can't explain that to them or if I can't do that myself, it's just not going to end up coming out the way that I want it to. Um, 
So in, in, in a kind of funny way, I put myself in a similar position to uh, where I was as a bass player in 2018, where now uh, the, the skill level that I have with, you know, mixing and production is definitely at a higher level than the rates that I am able to command for my work because I haven't put in the, the time building that network and the, the years required to com command the kind of the kind of rate that is usually commensurate with that level of work, but that's what it is. So yeah, keep grinding. It's going to come. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, this is an interesting question. Another one from Epic Chicken. Uh, he says, how does social media inform your content creation? Uh, do you mix, create things differently based on the media platform you're aiming for? Um, yeah, so for me, for me personally, uh, the main platform that I use is Instagram, just because it seems like the most functional social platform. That and the, the, the audio that you put on Instagram, despite the fact that it's also owned by Facebook, doesn't get murdered to death nearly as badly as Facebook does. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but anything that's even remotely already loud or compressed that gets put on Facebook, not only do they put it in mono for some reason, like, yo, why, what? It's 2020, what are you guys doing? But it just gets absolutely destroyed with compression. So yes. if, you're, if you're trying to share something on Facebook, probably the best way to do it is to not uh, upload it directly to Facebook. Just make a post about what it is that you're uploading and then drop a, a YouTube or Instagram or Vimeo or whatever you want link in the comments where people can actually hear it when it's not been killed. Yes, um, I totally agree. But uh, yeah, I mean, as, as far as like, you know, overall output levels, some, something that you're mixing specifically for YouTube or Instagram isn't going to be as, uh, as loud as you'd, you know, put, on like an actual record or, you know, put, put for download on Bandcamp or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but me, me personally, for the most part, I don't, I, I don't really make uh, YouTube specific content. So for me, I focus on making something as cool and interesting as I possibly can 60 seconds or under, because that's the, that's the Instagram time limit. Um, so yeah, with this, this P base video that I mentioned earlier, that's a little bit different in that it has a bunch of bases involved. So each video is a bit, is a, gonna be a long form thing that's more like eight minutes long because there's eight bases, but the actual clip that I'm gonna be posting on Instagram is just gonna be one of those bases in that particular style with a you know link in bio to the, the, the full length thing on YouTube. So yeah. I feel like if you're posting on both platforms, I would guess probably what the most useful thing to do, and you, I feel like you do a really good job with this with the neural stuff is You'll, you'll make a more long form video, but whatever, whatever you're, you're taking from that long form video is going to be a particularly interesting 30 to 60 second bit that can go on Instagram. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Making, um, to Epic chickens question. I think that there's definitely, you have to have different, formats for different platforms obviously because of like time limits or audio restrictions and whatnot but like not only that but you also have to think about the type of people who are on individual platforms and what they are looking to consume so you say like okay a twitch user is going to be vastly different than an instagram user because the twitch user is going to be with somebody who's like I got six hours to kill. I'm just going to chill and watch somebody else play video games, you know, or whatever. Yeah. That's then, such a crazy thing to me. <laughs> I know. That is so crazy. But I mean, that's, that's one of the cool things about what's happening right now. Like that's a perfect example, regardless of what your niche is, you could, you could make it huge right now on social mm -hmm. media. If you just put your, like who, who would have ever fucking thought that playing video games for hours People are going to pay to like, people are just making a full-time income, letting other people watch them play video games. Oh yeah. That's crazy. Some, and some it's people, so some awesome. Making six figures too. Like, that's, I know. That's what I'm, yeah. Like money. real adult money. Not like, <laughs> not like baby full-time income. <laughs> not like, like real adult. I can, I can buy a house in Texas in a couple years money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's insane. Uh, but yeah, Epic chicken. So like, 
make sure that you, the content that you're creating is geared towards the user that's, you know, going to be consuming it. Make it short, quick, funny, interesting for Instagram. You know, for YouTube, you can do something more educational, a little bit more in-depth, but don't do over, like, 15 minutes, you know, because I feel like 10 to 15 minutes is usually, like, that Goldilocks area that everybody's kind of like, I could commit that much time. And then, you know, then just go from there. Uh, yeah, finding facets of what you love to do and then trying to find ways to mold that to the particular platforms is always going to be to your benefit. Definitely. All right. So we're coming up just past two o'clock. So we'll start wrapping it up with a couple of last questions. Uh, anybody in the chat, go ahead and put your cues in now. So I got a couple of questions I, I had uh, prepped beforehand. Um, and I actually really like this question. Um, actually, my wife prepped this question. Uh, what has been your biggest mistake in your career and what did you learn from it? I'll actually add mm -hmm. on an additional one because I'm, I'm a big fan of Tim Ferriss. And one of my favorite questions that he asks is what is your what is a favorite mistake that sets you up for future success? Ooh, oh, that's that's a that's a really good question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to say the biggest mistake that I made was for forgetting that, you know, you're you're kind, you're kind of only as good as the last thing that you did. So. You know, uh, e even though I'd been playing music professionally for a decade, and I knew I knew what my worth was as a, a creator and a and a musician, I, I wasn't I wasn't getting calls. So I I needed I I should I shouldn't have just waited for for that dynamic to change because clearly it wasn't changing by itself, and I should have recognized what had put me in that position earlier and in in a way it wasn't anything that was uh through any fault of my own it was just the the local scene had changed i mean i'd even i'd even gotten some great gigs and recording sessions through craigslist uh in years past and that's not a thing anymore that doesn't exist <laughs> it really isn't like no no one no one gets any jobs there but i I've, right. I've gotten some like big big jobs um back in like you know 2010 2012 so um not being as adaptable as i should have been mm. definitely put me in a in a position where i mean very, very literally my, my my career was effectively over uh i i burned through most of my savings um need, needed to make a, a dramatic change and a part of what took me longer to get around to that than it should have is the fact that especially as a musician so much of what, uh, so much of that is like part of this avatar that you've created for yourself to show the world. So, you know, I, I'm Matthew, the bass player. I have, I have Matthew, the bass player.com. So if I'm not a bass player anymore, like it was sort of a little existential crisis. Like if I'm not Matthew, mm -hmm. the bass player, what, what even am I, what am I supposed to be now? So that, that definitely took me a little longer to get to that you know, peace of mind. We're like, Oh, obviously I don't, I don't have to stop making music. I just need right. to, I just need to do something different. And as soon as I made peace with the doing something different aspect and started doing some different things, fucking literally almost not overnight, overnight, but almost immediately the whole thing flipped itself. Right. So not, um, I get, I guess the overarching theme is if you're, if you're doing something and it's not working, change whatever it is yeah. in any, any aspect of your professional or personal life. If you're doing something and it's just not working, stop, stop beating your head against that wall and change. Cause that's the universe going, yo, this isn't it. <laughs> Buy something else. Dude, I, I totally understand. I, like something you said actually was really like kind of hit a chord with me too, is that you're only as good as your last project. I like that. That is such a valuable lesson because you have to get through your project, you have to get through your song, and then you have to almost basically just forget it because now you have to move on to the next thing. Like I, I remember growing up in uh, the Sacramento, Sacramento music scene and you'd have these like band dads who would talk about shows that they played when they were in their 20s and 30s like, oh yeah, we opened for this band or that band. It's like, cool, what have you done since then? Like you got anything interesting going on now? Like, nope. They don't. And I, that was like a lesson that I took away from that 
thankfully very early on that, you know, I don't, I don't like really talking about the past things that I've done. Some people have asked about like, you know, previous projects, like, oh, is your music still up on, uh, online? And I'm like, yeah, it is. And you could find it, <laughs> but I don't want you to, <laughs> yeah. 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 you know, cause it's like, yeah, I've, I've, I've opened for big bands, but that doesn't matter anymore. You know, because again, it's like, I'm constantly trying to look forward to the next project that can, that I can continue building that success upon rather 100%. than that past success. Yep. And that doesn't yeah. matter anymore. Yeah. O opening a, a summer amphitheater tour for Breaking Benjamin and, and Chevelle and Three Days Grace isn't doing jack shit to pay my bills right now. So resting <laughs> exactly. on that moral wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't do me, wouldn't do me any favors. Um, to circle back to that Tim Ferriss question, because it kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier, and that's a different answer. Uh, my favorite mistake is how I met my wife, and that was through playing music. Uh, when I was at MI, uh, I'll make a story quick because I know we're probably running short on time. Oh, dude, we, 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 we still got time. I, I want to hear this answer. Cool. All right. It's, well, it's, a, it's a good story. So um, at MI, there is a course requirement called Live Performance Workshop. And essentially what it does is prepare you for real life audition situations. So if you, if you haven't been on a, on a music audition before in a, in a main music city for like a label kind of gig, typically what happens is it's not exactly a cattle call, but you'll get an, you'll get an assigned time slot and then you'll come in and play a song or two songs with a whole band that you've never ever played with before. You've never rehearsed with them. You've never even met these guys before. It might even be a whole band of guys who are also auditioning for spots and aren't in the band. So it might be a bunch of like four or five totally green guys who have, who have never played this music together before. And that's what the, the LPW did. You'd basically pick a style every week, you know, modern rock or funk or country, get assigned a song and a time slot mm -hmm. and go on stage with a bunch of guys who you may never have even met in real life before mm -hmm. to play this song. And the goal was, and what you literally should be able to do as a professional player is to play it fucking perfectly. It should sound like the record. There's no reason not to. The song is this, you're playing it exactly like the record. Everyone's had the recording for a week. That's, that's kind of the job. So uh, super cool, real life kind of, kind of challenge. So, so one week I was, I was waiting to do the modern rock uh, LPW, which was a green day song. It was American idiot. Mm -hmm. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with that song, it's not super complicated, but the drum part in particular requires a good amount of right hand dexterity and endurance just because he's playing 16 notes on the hat nonstop. That's the whole thing. Um, and as I was waiting, uh, a guy walked in who had a, a Death by Stereo t-shirt on. I don't know if you guys know who they are, but they're like this little hardcore band. Most people don't know who Death by Stereo is. Uh, so I just struck up a conversation with him. I was a punk rock kid. I was like, ah, cool. This guy knows who Death by Stereo is. And we got to talking and he's a drummer and, and he's got a band and they sound sort of like System of a Down, but a little more progressive. And I was like, oh man, that sounds super cool. I'm really into that. You guys need a bass player too? Well, rad, man. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely come to, come to rehearsal and meet you guys and check it out. Send me some stuff. Cool. And then he went on stage to play. He, he was so bad that he literally got broomed off the stage with a music stand. One of the teachers came on stage, flipped a music stand upside down and shuffled his ass off the stage because he couldn't play that 16 note hat part. He just couldn't play it. And I'm, I don't know if it's because he, he, I mean, it was hilarious. And that's, that's oh, man. It wasn't the only time this has happened either. Like if, if anyone ever bombed and they weren't like, obviously it wasn't happening the teachers would call it and be like, nah, get the fuck out of here. That's not it. <laughs> <laughs> Come back when you don't suck so much. Sorry. Oh, uh, beautiful. And I still went to that rehearsal, even though this guy, this kind of objectively terrible drummer was going to be the drummer of this band. I still went because I was, I was still green and whatever. There was no reason not to. Sure. And, sure. uh, my wife was the singer for the band at the time. Uh, so we, we were both seeing other people. We didn't, we didn't even start dating until maybe a year or two after that. But the kind of the point that I'm getting at in the story is that all, all of these crazy sort of coincidences had to happen 
all in secession for us to ever even meet each other. So this, this fucking amazing thing in my life happened because this guy wore a punk band shirt that nobody knows uh, because I happened to strike up a conversation with him about that shirt because he happened to have a band that needed a bass player and because I happened to decide, yeah, well, screw it. <laughs> he, he seems to have good musical tastes and he, he said he was going to have some pop. So I get whatever, I'll go. Should sure. be fine. Yeah. But if any one of those things hadn't happened, this other amazing thing wouldn't exist. Mm. So especially especially when you're green and first starting out, just say yes to stuff because you just never, you really never know. That gig with LP is another great example. I said yes to this silly little gig that we played two local club shows and never did anything. I was never really even into the music. Mm. It wasn't like n nothing about it really got my rocks off. The people in the band were nice people. The singers were nice people, but it was kind of a nothing gig that never did anything. And up until the the Diamante gig, that was that was probably the bigger gig that I've ever done, getting to fly to other countries and play shows to 10 or 20 or 40,000 people. Never would have happened if I didn't say yes to this this tiny little nothing local gig. That's so awesome. That's such a great story. Thank you. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, jo I joked for many years that I met my wife on Craigslist. Because <laughs> she, she originally found the band through Craigslist. That was another oh. series of coincidences. Yeah. She went through a bad breakup and was looking for an outlet and found this band through Craigslist. And they'd fired their bass player like a month or two ago. And I mm -hmm. guess that same week, she'd even told them like, yo, if you guys don't get a bass player in here by this next rehearsal, I'm gone. So that was like our that was our one window to ever come into contact with each other and after that she was moving back to arizona and i you know i fucked that whole plan up so <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah for the better for the better yeah for the better uh let's see so i got two questions left uh from both from epic chicken epic chicken you've been asking really great questions this whole time you man. are an epic chicken epic you, chicken you are yes <laughs> um so he's the first question he asks is uh, what was the tipping point for for you when you realized you could have a full-time career in music? Oh man, I don't think, that, I honestly don't think there was one. Um, I was just, I had decided that this is what I wanted to do. So I was just singularly focused on making it happen. I mean, for, for a, I mean, really kind of until 2018, I didn't give any consideration to the possibility of failing. I just did nonstop. So there was there there definitely wasn't like yeah there definitely wasn't like a tipping point or like this magical light bulb moment where I was like oh wow this could really work I just sort of slowly built it over time and just yeah just just made it happen I mean there was, I had, I had I had stretches where I didn't didn't have a place to live uh, <laughs> you know had to had to had to work shitty jobs to to save up money to even go to school for a while i was i was uh, sleeping on my mom's couch for a bit she's a wonderful lady and helped me out in that way and while i was you know waiting tables saving up money and did uh, did door-to-door -door fundraising for charities while i was at school all, all kinds of stuff but it was just i wanted to be a professional musician and i was putting in the non-stop hours every single day with the intention of making that happen, whether it was playing or trying trying to get jobs, auditioning for jobs, talking to people about jobs, responding to, to Craigslist ads, which again, isn't really a thing now, but ba back when I first started, that was the way I was getting a lot of work, getting getting cover band gigs, kind of, again, saying, saying yes to every opportunity that you had to build into this thing that you're trying to do, because it's definitely not a, you're going to go from not making any money to making a full-time income that week or that year. Probably that's probably not going to happen. Right. No, that's, that's, that's pretty fair. I mean, like it, the, I think, I think so many people are looking to, uh, what I, what I've heard phrased as uh, overlap, you know? So like people, people are generally doing their nine to five jobs and trying to overlap into full-time music, which is obviously like the way to go. Like I, I tell people the way, the way that I went about my transition, I wouldn't ever suggest to anybody <laughs> because. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't quit your whole life and just wish. 
Yeah. It's probably yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um well cuz like I I lost my job. The 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 shop that I worked at in Sacramento closed down and I just made an effort. You know, I just thought like, okay, I'm going to dedicate myself to doing this and it's going to suck and I had a lot of help along the way to get to where I'm at. Um but yeah, I think a lot of people these days are looking for that, you know, that that movement over into the thing that they're passionate about while still maintaining that income while still, you know, maintaining yeah. a livable lifestyle. And I, and I, I totally get that. But it, to your point, like, I think that putting in the time outside of your work and dedicating a severe effort and making sure that your intention is, is, is sufficient, uh, in, in putting it into your, your passion is, is going to be, is going to be paramount to your success. Um, you know, choosing to not watch YouTube, choosing to not watch Netflix and I really to say that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Just dedicating the time to actually making sure your success is viable is going to be so imperative. It's going to yep. be so imperative. Every, everyone actually has enough time in a day to do what they want to do. They really do. They just have to figure out what the thing is that they want to do and then dedicate the time to that. Mm -hmm. Same, my, my wife sees it with, with people who say they want to get into shape, but then they're doing things that my wife's a, a personal trainer, but then they're doing things that clearly show that that's not actually their number one priority. Yep. So if you're, if your number one priority is to create a new career for yourself in whatever field and after your nine to five job, you're watching two hours worth of Netflix, that's not really your number one priority. You just mm -hmm. don't want it. Because if you did, that's what you'd be doing. You'd be fucking on fire about it, which is why I was talking earlier about finding whatever the thing is that you're really that passionate about, because that's the only way you will voluntarily put in the amount of suck hours to get good at something. Because like, like, you, like you just said right now, you know, at the beginning, it's going to suck. It's going to. It's not going to be great. You're probably not even good at the thing that you're trying to get good at yet. So not only are you not making any money at it yet, but you're not even personally satisfied with your own creative output. The end of most days might be you looking back at what you've done for that day and going, "Ugh, this is totally. shit. Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. Some of yeah. the first videos I did for neural, I go back and watch them. I'm like, uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> but that's a good thing. That, that means yeah. that means you're not resting on your laurels. You're always wanting to, to get better. You're, mm -hmm. you're remembering you're only as good as the last thing that you just did. And as soon as you're done with that thing, you're already wanting to, it's the same thing with fucking mix engineering, man. That's, that's yes. a huge hurdle for people to get over. Eventually Absolutely. it's gotta be done. So it's not, it's probably not going to be perfect because you're going to finish it. And next week you're going to go, ah, oh, man, I should have put more <laughs> blah on the snare reverb. You know, yep. <laughs> but yep. no, nah, fin finish it and get it done. But yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to, trying to make something like that happen and you have a great nine to five job, keep your job, take whatever extra time that you can from any other activity that you have in your life that's less important to you than this new thing and dedicate it to that. And it will happen if you put in that kind of effort over long enough of a timeline. It happens for everybody. You just have to put in that amount of effort. Yep. Totally agree. Uh, well, well, you know, this is a great ending question. Uh, Epic Chicken again also asks a uh, unrelated, he says unrelated question, but I think this is actually very pertinent to uh, current circumstances. He says, uh, what keeps you feeling inspired these days? Oh, yeah, man. Uh, all, all kinds of stuff, really. I mean, it's. I feel like it's really easy to get stuck in either side of that uh, dynamic, whether you're inspired towards negativity or positivity right now, there's a lot of content out there to in, inspire thoughts in people. Um, think things right now are, are tough for a lot of folks. There's, there's a bunch of pretty intense, uh, social and political movements happening. It's super easy to get stuck in that train of thought. And at the same time, people are putting out some of the best music that's ever been made. People are people are doing incredible new things in, in science and technical fields every day. So part of it is what you're dedicating your 
attention to really because there is as much content as you care to consume about any possible thing in the known universe right now so so pick pick, pick which thing you want and I, I i'm not perfect with that i struggle with it too um especially when some of these these movements started started popping off i i got like ge genuinely depressed for a little bit uh, and had to had to dig back in into working out pretty pretty seriously like push myself so hard that I would almost pass out puke kind of thing just to get that catharsis out because I wasn't uh, I wasn't able to get that through through the performance of live music which is a big part of what's kept me sane and sustained over the years when I struggled with depression or whatever else being able to get up on stage and sweat and scream was man that was I would I would call it life-saving without being hyperbolic about it Right. right. So fi find people who inspire you and keep involved with them, um, re regardless of what field of content they're in. Again, if you, if you guys aren't following Gary Vee, we've, we've talked about so much stuff that he discusses regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's, he's great about keeping, keeping that positive mindset. Fo follow people like Neural DSP who are constantly creating new i mean there's there's a reason that this company has blown up as massively as they have in the last couple of years they are not resting at all D doug is a crazy person man he's, he's a mad man <laughs> I, I mean yeah he, he might actually be a little bit crazy but in the best possible <laughs> way he's he, he is he is literally changing the musical world to suit the vision in his head there's a there's a brilliant thrice lyric off of the the last album or the album before, um, what is it? True progress means matching the world to the vision in our heads, but mm. we always change the vision instead. That's beautiful. Progress, match the world to the vision in your head. Don't fucking settle for what is. That's amazing, dude. I love it. Well, I think that's a great, a great note to end on. Uh, how can people find you on the socials? Like I said, it is Matthew the bass player. Good. Google that <laughs> shit, Instagram that shit, YouTube that shit, whatever you want. That's that's where I am. Yeah, go go check him out. Give him some light. Give, give give him some love. It's uh he he does great stuff. And we're working on more stuff for the neural page too, so you're definitely going to see him there very very shortly. We are indeed. So, awesome. Dude, thank you so much. I I love this conversation. This was fantastic. Yeah, it was great, man. Lots of fun. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course, of course. And uh, for anybody who's hanging out in the chat, thank you so much for asking such great questions, especially you, Epic Chicken. Looking at you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you all so much. This has been fantastic. And uh, as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers, y'all.